All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for attending this webinar today, um, talking about the Master of Legal Studies in Cybersecurity and Data Privacy. Um, with me today, well, let me back up first. I should probably introduce myself, though those that I see that are attending, um, we have spoken multiple times, so it's really great to see you here. Um, but for anybody that joins that I may not know, I am Julie DiBiasio, the Director of Graduate Studies and Professional Development here at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. And like I said, if I don't know you yet, hopefully I will very soon as you think about this program or the certificate program or, or just your interest in this space. Um, but what you are all here for today, of course, is to hear from Brian Ray and Holly Drake. I'm going to introduce Brian, and then Brian will introduce our special guest, Holly. Um, Brian co-found and directs the Center for Cybersecurity and Privacy Protection at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. He is a professor in our JD program, but most importantly, he is a professor in this Master of Legal Studies in Cybersecurity and Data Privacy. And because I work very closely with the students in the beginning, and then of course, during their time in the program, I can tell you firsthand, Brian is a wonderful professor. I hear nothing but great things um, <laughs> about him. They're so excited to have him as a professor and of course, as a mentor throughout the whole program. So Brian, I'm gonna toss it over to you to tell a little bit more about yourself and then of course, introduce our special, special guest, Holly. Thanks, Julie. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, Julie always does a great job embarrassing me, but um, we really do <laughs> have a, <laughs> that's fine. We have a great program um, that I'm, I'm very proud of because I built it uh, from scratch and, and recruited a lot of great people uh, who teach in it. We'll talk more about that uh, later in the program. But as, as Julie said, we're really pleased to have uh, with us today, Holly Drake. Holly is a member of the center's advisory board uh, and um, she is the chief privacy officer at the Ohio State University Office of Compliance. Uh, and I think you've got a new name now, Ali, don't you? A, a cool new, or, or am I missing yeah, that on your tent? Yeah, we're also like the Office of Technology and Digital Innovation. Uh, technology so have, and Digital I two, Innovation. I have two bosses, so I have a dual report. Oh, so, I, so you, which it's I'll just talk more about work, in a right? Minute. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, it's just more meetings. It's all about more meetings. <laughs> more meetings. That's right. That's right. Yeah, add, add stuff. Um, uh, but Holly is an, an experienced uh, privacy professional. Uh, she's not a lawyer. She uh, comes from the compliance space, uh, but she has a number of certifications, uh, and we will talk more about that. And she uh, also has a background in Russian languages and literature, uh, so she is a, a true Renaissance woman. And so, Holly, welcome. And thank you for joining us to discuss privacy uh, careers and um, especially with the focus on, on careers for non-lawyers uh, in this space and in compliance generally. I, I want to say to our, our participants, um, feel free throughout to, uh, to throw uh, questions into the chat and we're happy to answer them as we go along. We, we really want to tell us to, you know, to tell you what you're interested in. Um, and we will plan to go about 15, 20 minutes uh, interviewing Holly. And then Julie is going to go into some of the basics about our program and how to apply if you're interested. Uh, but as I said, all along the way, just feel free to, um, to pop questions in the chat. Julie will be monitoring it and we'll, we'll ping us if, um, if there's something we, we can answer. So Holly. I'm ready. You've been doing this for how many years over almost 20 20 20 yeah 20 so we got to update that too that's probably putting a date in your official bio is uh every year it changes right so i, yeah, I was doing problem. the math about 20 about 20 is, you know that's a nice long time mm -hmm. um and you're now chief privacy officer of a you know a major research university the ohio state university i'm a proud graduate of the jd mm -hmm. program there um, tell us about what, what, what do you do? What does a chief what is privacy a, officer what is do? A, what does a chief privacy officer do? Um, yeah. a, a lot of things, a lot of things. So my, my, the way I think about my day is we are, we have a um, formal privacy program that has, um, it's based in a, a framework, a compliance framework that's um, based on the federal sentencing guidelines. So if you guys are new, interested in um, law school, you'll get to know the federal sentencing 
guidelines pretty well. So these are, these are um, foundational practices that a compliance program should have in order to be effective. And so what we're really trying to do is demonstrate that we have an effective privacy program. And these guidelines help you prioritize that. So they include things like, I like could show a chart in a minute if you want, but they include things like regulatory inventory. What are the regulations that apply to your institution? They talk about the controls or the activities you need to do in privacy in order to have a good program. So for us, we have privacy impact assessments that we conduct on technology implementations to think through privacy considerations when we roll out new tech to students, for example. So the day is really spent um, on that prioritized list of what am I doing to move the program forward. I'm as a small but mighty team. So I, um, I also lead security governance at Ohio State. So I have a pretty big team, but there's two of us doing privacy work sort of full time. And the work gets done mostly through working groups. So any place you work in privacy, so I um, started my career in financial services, working groups are how the privacy work gets done. And it's no different in higher ed. So I have about six working groups that are tackling different elements of the program to move it forward. And so most of my days are spent preparing for those working groups, reporting on our progress. And then of course, we also have incidents. So when um, somebody has a privacy concern, they reach out to my office for discussion, investigation, and consideration. So that's sort of a typical day. Excellent. And, and um, uh, for those of you attendees who are interested, uh, we, we did a couple weeks ago a deep dive into compliance generally, and we'd be happy to share that video. Um, and as you pointed out, it's, you know, it's, really, it, it's really striking that what we talk about as compliance as a specific field and then privacy as a component of that mm -hmm. uh, starts with the federal sentencing guidelines, which is these are the sentencing guidelines for criminals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, um, you know, two interesting things about that one uh, that that's in part kind of what what gives it a sharp edge and drives, um, you know, some some real uh, demand, institutional demand within organizations. If you can say, hey, you know, there is potential criminal liability here. Um, but then, it, you know, it's kind of, a, you know, curious and, and an interesting phenomenon that we we built really an entire um, entire field uh, compliance, which sometimes has lawyers and sometimes doesn't have lawyers, often does not, right, as, as in your case. So so tell me a little bit more about the, the not just the teams, but in general, sort of how you fit within the organization. Who, what are the kinds of professionals that you're working with day to day, both reporting up to, collaborating with, and then managing? Sure. So I, um, I report to the chief compliance officer at Ohio State, and I also report to the chief information security officer. And um, which is which is good because the program goes to the C the CIO or the um, the chief compliance officer and the chief information security officer is often the area that has funding and so for for just that purpose that that can be a good thing. Um, so throughout the day, I work a lot. I work very closely with a privacy lawyer who's assigned to my program, and the way we tag team is. Um, he helps with whenever I get to a, pl a place where I need interpretation of a privacy law or specific guidance on the privacy law. That's really his expertise and his focus and his role. I've been doing this and working with lawyers for 20 years. And so I have ideas about what I think. And so that's helpful, but it really, that's his legal advice. Um, and I say his as it is a guy. Um, it's Dan Bierk. But then my role is to take his legal advice and then implement it. And that's the role of a compliance program. And the, the, the fun part about compliance is you get to solve the tricky problems, right? So it's somewhat easy for the lawyer to say, this European privacy law requires you to do these three things. And then the fun that I get to have is, can I do those three things? Um, can I do one of those three things and get a little bit better at managing privacy? Can I do three things over three years and get even better? And how do you bring the university along? So, so I work pretty closely with, with that group. There's also contracts. So privacy shows up a lot in agreements with vendors and third parties. And more and more parties are asking Ohio State, um, hey, before we give you our data, we wanna know that you have a privacy and a security program. So contracts is a big area. Right. 
I've been spending a lot more time with Title IX lately. So this is mm. a phenomenon in higher ed. It's not a thing that you really have as much in the private sector, but making sure that we're being considerate of all the different populations that visit Ohio State and not treating them dis differently or disparate treatment is a new thing. And so that's sort of my, probably my main core focus. Um, I partner really closely with the medical center. So Ohio State has a yeah. full functioning hospital and they have a HIPAA privacy officer in that group. And she is in charge of compliance there and focuses on patient privacy. So she's working on HIPAA, but to the extent the privacy issues are around um, texting incoming medical students or um, running in advanced analytics on research participants, that would fall into my my purview. And so we partner closely as we sort of navigate that world. So that's another area that, that we spend a lot of time working with. Excellent. That, 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 yeah, I hadn't thought about that aspect of, it. and just for our attendees, HIPAA is the major, is the major federal law governing health privacy. So patient privacy. Um, and, and I also hadn't thought about the research side, right? That is a, that's a big aspect that, uh, not only just not just from the the not just from the medical school, right? I assume, or or do you get involved in the other uh, other research um, areas? We, we do. It's what makes higher ed so fun. So we yeah. are a research one and R one institution, which means we get a lot of funding um, for research projects. We have Dep Department of the Defense top secret funding that we can't talk about uh, research that we do, um, and and everything sort of in between. So we have. A research building that we're we're building, and I was in a meeting talking about preserving the privacy and the security of mice who will be part of those research experiments. And so it's really the whole gamut that you get to the, experience in higher ed. The privacy and the security of the mice, you said. I feel like everyone should have their privacy yeah, preserved. Yeah, good. But, you know, well, and also really interesting that you're you're getting involved in the Title IX issues, which are not strictly speaking privacy, but as as you know as as your experience suggests. There's a clear overlap, right, between uh, non-discrimination and and you know proactive accommodation of um, of different genders uh, and self-identified genders and and privacy, right? Because it is you know it, it it sort of sits in that same constellation. I want to circle back it's to also you. Also, like it's oh, it's, go ahead. it's established. So what's helpful with privacy is you have a program that's established. So these weird issues that don't exactly fit, it right. can it can work. So that can be helpful. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, so uh, a couple points. One, as you say, privacy is a component of larger compliance, and it operates in that in that um, you know with that same toolkit, that same approach. Uh, what I would call a risk based approach. And and to circle back to your 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 first discussion around the relationship with the privacy lawyer, um, absolutely. I mean, from my perspective both teaching this stuff and then working with a lot of professionals in the field. Uh, in some ways, the lawyer's job is easier. The lawyer's job is to kind of say, okay, you know, GDPR, the European regulation uh, requires, you know, sometimes it's concrete and GDPR tends to be more concrete, but more often it's a kind of, okay, you've got to do, you know, you've got to generally allow uh, data subjects access to the information. So you have to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And um, that's the legal requirement, but the law doesn't specify that you have to do it in a certain way. And so, as you say, the compliance professional really is in the weeds, mm -hmm. again, in, in consultation with the lawyers, but really is the operationalizing this, trying to say, okay, as, a, as an organization whose primary goal is not to provide data subjects access to the information, that's not the business we're in, right? How right. do we consistent with our business aims and our, our you know, and our objectives as a nonprofit in, the, in your case, or, you know, educational institution, uh, uh, comply with those requirements? And, and what, what does, um, you know, what, what's a, from the legal side, again, we call, you know, we, th we think about defensible, what's a defensible privacy program? Um, that I can justify the decisions I've made and the priorities I've set because given all the activity going on, I can't, I can't probably do everything that I'd like to do. And I might not even be doing everything that the, the law or the or courts even, or, the, or certainly legal counsel has said, these are the concrete things we think we need to get to. Mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're maturing that program in a direction to trying to hit all that. And then dealing with the kind of 
fires along the way, right? The inevitable right. gaps or failures to fully implement uh, the program. Uh, and so, but yeah, the compliance professional really is doing that, that creative work of here's what we're going to do. And then, and then having to work with the business side, right. To say, okay, um, these are the things that, you know, talk to me about how, how difficult would it be for you to put this into this, this process into place, um, you know, and, and how can I enable you to accomplish your goals, but still meet the things I know we need to do. It's interesting when, when I got here and I, I think that wherever you work, you have to spend time thinking about the culture of the institution or the company or the tea you're part of and what like sort of resonates with that group. Um, in financial services, complying with a regulation is, is compelling. And so that's a story that, that you can use. I call it a tool. So it's the tool you can use to try to influence getting things done. Because compliance right. professionals at their root are just influencers, right? I don't hire the team that programs the website that does the thing. I have to persuade that team to do it. And in higher ed, it quickly learned. I really felt that the regulation was not going to be the way to do it in higher ed um, for two reasons. One, um, if you build a privacy program on like fear of compliance or fear of GDPR, it's hard to sustain the momentum when nothing happens. Right, and um, right. The, that didn't feel like the right approach, although it was the reason they posted my position. Yeah, and yeah. But what resonates with higher ed is values. And so I spent a lot of time and our compliance framework at its root has leadership values and individual values as a core part of our compliance program. Because at the end of the day, I have to persuade a faculty member to pick the secure privacy enabled solution and not the other one. And that right. comes from their their heart, their values, their choice, and not from like my policy. And so I I posted in the chat, we started with the fair information privacy or fair information practice principles, the FIPS, mm -hmm. which are values based and they map to regulation. So my job behind the scenes is to deal with the regs, but faculty members could care less about that. They care about right. the ethical use of their data. And so that's where I started. And so working through that, you're like, you, a privacy program supports free speech. A privacy program supports a, a, a healthy democracy. And so they get that. If you went to a bank and talked about healthy democracy support in a privacy program, they'd be like, what are you talking about? Yeah. So really knowing where you work is right. important. Right. <laughs> right. I think. No, the, the bank you're talking about, you know, here are the FTC fines that were levied under GLBA. Yeah, right? here's what California. Um, and, and in higher ed, yeah. we don't have to worry about state laws. We're like sovereign immunity. We get to do right. one thing. Yeah. Right. And, and, and interestingly, the major federal regulation FERPA is sort of, you know, about the thinnest uh, in terms Very of toothless. Yeah. consequences. And yet, as you say, it was certainly in my experience talking to higher ed professionals, there's a, there's a, you know, a real commitment to the spirit of it, as opposed to uh, a kind of purely risk-based approach to, well, you know, as between implementing this process and saving X, you know, you know, right. what are the downside risks? There's there are very few, but. Um, and, and when uh, I catalog yeah. my privacy risks, so I have the privacy risks that I think about for the organization and what I'm doing to manage them. Regulatory risk is like one of six, right? So the, a bigger privacy risk for us is trust from our students. Right. So we're right. collecting a lot of data on them. So I want to maintain that trust. Um, that's more important than um, FERPA compliance. So right. And as you there. say, you know, you're, you're a lot like a health system, although in a health system, the doctors do have direct potential exposure uh, under HIPAA, under FERPA, the faculty members really don't. In fact, the organization does not. So appealing to their, you know, to their calling of, you know, look, protect your students. This is how we protect the students. That makes a lot of sense. Right. So let's pivot a little bit, and then um, I want to I want to give um, our guests a chance to ask questions. And again, as I said at the beginning, please throw them in the chat if you have them now. But we'll 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 pause before Julie goes into the details of the program to have a kind of you know formal open. Uh, give us your questions, uh, and and we're happy to put you on screen if you want if you're more comfortable doing it that way. Uh, but let's let's talk about what it you know where you came from and the skill sets that you know that that you think are valuable and you would look for on team members for you. So first tell us a little about what, what, tell us about your career arc. 
Sure, I um I have a bachelor's from Ohio State. I um, spent a year in Russia teaching English. I came back and worked. I went to Case Western Reserve University, so I have a master's degree in social work, which is a lot of um, getting people to change and do different things. So it actually works yeah. well for this profession. And um, all the other work I did with privacy and security and governance, I just learned along the way. So I started working, you know, in privacy when the first privacy laws were coming out. Um, once we complied with those, the data breach laws started publishing and coming out. And so then I pivoted more to an information security focus because that was needed for the privacy expertise. Um, then we kind of did well with that. And then the next thing you know, all these privacy laws started coming again around restricting use of data. And so then I pivoted a little bit more to that type of work. Um, so I think just being nimble in your career and being really curious about new new things is important. And don't, in this profession, you, you can't be afraid of the technology. I'm not a technologist. I don't have a computer degree, but you need to um, put yourself in the place where you're learning about different information security controls, like privileged access management. What is data loss prevention? Um, because that helps your privacy program and thinking about privacy. And you don't have to be a technician. Um, I imagine Julie's going to tell you this to understand cybersecurity principles, cybersecurity law, and privacy law. The technical people can do that. You need you don't need to know how encryption works. You don't need to know that complex factoring and the math. You just need to know it's a good control that helps you comply with laws. And that 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 curiosity is really important. I think for me, the the skills I look forward to are just really um, creative solution thinking people, um, people who love to, to read and are excellent communicators, um, excellent at writing, excellent at presenting, um, excellent and taking complicated regulatory things and making it feel easy is, is an art. And that's something you should practice while, while you're in the program. I think those are, those are pretty, pretty yeah. solid. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm going to touch on a few of those. I mean, what you said about understanding technology you know, that syncs up with your earlier comment around the compliance role really is, is, you know, putting the rubber to the road, making, making the legal interpretation work within the organization. And as you said before, you're not going to implement the controls. Uh, there might be some policies that you're doing yeah. directly, but for the most part, it's, and a lot of this is really a, a, in the realm of the IT staff, right? Mm -hmm. And and so part of being able to work with them is not just taking a, a you know, a pre pre-configured tick the box list of things and saying, okay, you got to do these without understanding what they mean. It's being able to talk to them, being able yourself to kind of think through, okay, I think my own sense of it is this sort of configuration of controls probably best fits mm -hmm. the regulatory requirements, but you know, you're the technologist, tell me how hard will it be? How expensive will it be? And then being able to understand enough to be able to say, or if they offer up a, an alternative set of controls, tech, when we talk about controls, we're talking about really just, they can be anything from physical measures, locking a room that has servers mm -hmm. to implementing technical um, tools like a firewall, um, you know, to just configuring a website in certain ways to be able to give out, you know, to be able to enable requests and then, and then figuring out how to, how to implement those, but, but understanding at enough depth to be able to work collaboratively with the technical staff on the best configuration and making sure that, you know, that the changes get made as needed. Um, you know, that strikes me as, as pretty important. And then on the legal side, um, I mean, each of the pivots you mentioned were triggered by changes yeah. in the law and the regulatory environment. Right. Um, how did you, how do you keep up with that? It's a struggle, it changes so fast. So I'm a member of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. So I have um, a couple of certifications through them. I have a couple of cert security certifications. And so the when you're certified, you have to keep getting continuing education to keep them up. So that right. helps. Um, I also lead a couple of um, cross-functional privacy officer groups where we share ideas. So there's one through higher ed and there's one for members of the Big Ten. So Ohio State is a Big Ten institution. The privacy officers convene and share tips and tricks and frustrations every couple of weeks as we try to build out our programs are the big ways. Yeah. 
And and so you mentioned certifications, and as you said, the International Association of Privacy Professionals uh, has emerged as the the kind of dominant um, industry group uh, in this field, and they offer a number of certifications that are they're not they're not yet kind of required, except in some instances, but they're de facto recognized as okay. This person has. Um, you know, has a has a, a core understanding of these areas, and there's a number of them. Uh, and, it, and I noticed you do have several of them as well as you said on the security side. There's some security certifications. So just before we pivot, and we'll go here in a second uh, after we open for questions to the program that we offer. What what's the difference in your mind between these certifications and say a full blown degree program? Um, you know, I think that the full blown blown degree program will give you just much more. Um, practical skills to take to your job. So the, the program will give you more, I call it tools in your toolkit. So the certification is a tool because you can first, you, you have that, you're showing and demonstrating you have this expertise, but it's not the same as understanding how to persuade people to do things they don't, mm -hmm. may not want to do. So it, in, at its root, a security and privacy professional is asking an employee, a team, a department, to pay for something they don't want to pay for, implement a control they may not want to, or short, like stop their business in a way. And the program will teach you different techniques to get that outcome well. And so it's not, it's, some of it is sort of woo and being charming and persuading them to do it, but having that expertise where you can say, I know you can't do A, which is what we need to do, but can you do C? Because at least it's managing some of the risk and you'll learn that through the program, what those, those things are, and you'll learn them faster. Then I sort of had to do it like trial and error with my it colleagues. Because this didn't, yeah. this field didn't exist, right? It, I know. It was like yeah. nascent. Um, and, and that is, you know, to, to, to return to what you said earlier, uh, it, this field is, is, it just keeps growing, right? And now, and it's, it's, it, it, it's, I mean, I, I, I would, it's not fully formalized in the way some fields are, but it's, it's certainly on the cusp of that. And, and it's certainly fully formed in the sense that, you know, there wasn't a chief privacy officer. I don't know, when did Ohio implement that, Ohio State implement that position? Certainly not I 10 was, years I ago, right? I was the first, right? I was the first, yeah. so it was about three years ago. Only three yeah. years ago, only three years yeah. ago. So that, you know, and it's, and actually not, we don't have one at Cleveland State. Um, but anyway, so, um, yeah. yeah, I think, I think you captured it accurately. So the, the way we view it, the certifications are, they're the badge, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, you, they're very useful. I encourage my, my uh, law students when they're getting out with the J, with a full on JD, I say, look, go, if you want to be in this field, get a, get the IPP um, certified information privacy professional. Uh, it just shows when your early career that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm committed to this field and equally important, it connects you to a network by just, you know, you don't have to get the certification, but it helps and joining the IPP. And so we have a strong relationship with them and we, our, our larger courses go into more depth um, and they'll focus on the, on the kind of all the details you have to cram to get the certification, but more on, all right, how does this all work together? And then we try to give you that 360 degree, but we'll get, we'll, we'll, we'll turn back to that. But certifications are, are absolutely valuable. And we, we try to point students in the direction of how to get those and which ones we think are most uh, useful. And then our, our content provides the, the background for you to be able to then do the more specific kind of um, cramming that's required to get to get one of those. So uh, real briefly, before I turn it back to Julie, um, any questions from our attendees? Okay, so um, Holly, thank you for that. That was a, sure. that was a great exploration of um, you know, what you do in this field. Um, to hang on with us, but sure. um, the rest of this is Julie's just gonna, Julie and I are gonna go through the program and um, tell folks if they're interested how to, how to, how to get more information and how to apply. Um, and so Julie, I see you got the curriculum up. Why don't I start, why don't I start there? And then, um, and then I'll hand it back to you. How does that sound? That sounds great. Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute. Oh, Please that's fine. go no ahead. Worries. No <laughs> worries. So um, as, as Holly and I were discussing, um, 
our program is a what we like to we like to call it a 360 degree view of cybersecurity and privacy. We we cover the legal, technical, uh, business, and operational aspects uh, of both of these fields, and they're related, as as Holly mentioned, but they are distinct and they require. Um, some distinct, um, certainly regulate, from a regulatory perspective, there are just distinctive laws that, that hit on each one of them. And then operationally, you're dealing with slightly different, um, different teams and aspects of the internal organization. Um, so our program, um, you, you almost always start with Introduction to American Law um, and on the legal uh, and business side, uh, that's the course that I created and, and teach most of the time. Um, and it's a survey of the, the major areas of law that you would encounter as a first year law student and that you um, would would encounter as a professional in this field. Uh, and we go through it uh, pretty quickly, but but um, we do, you know, we do a nice job of getting you up to speed, even if you have no legal background at all. Uh, and that's what that course is is tied for. Or, or, or that course and the legal writing course are the are, are dovetail and provide the the thorough grounding in the law for non-lawyers. And I should mention um, this program, we have a number of attorneys who are in the program uh, because outside of those two courses, all the rest of these courses are advanced courses in the legal and technical aspects of this discipline. And, and if you do you have a JD already and are interested in the program, we're, we're happy to work with you to waive those first two uh, core legal courses. But for those who don't have a legal background, those are the, the foundations. Um, and then on the technical side, cybersecurity one and two, again, are, are these dovetail courses that give you a fairly in-depth technical understanding of cybersecurity uh, and privacy, uh, the focused on cybersecurity. In cybersecurity one, uh, we really throw you a little bit in the deep end, but with lots of, uh, lots of handholding and, and protection, we very quickly get you into using technical labs that advanced um, computer science students would use. Uh, and learn how to do some, some basic hacking techniques, um, as well as other aspects of how the technical side of cybersecurity works. And again, to, to what Holly was, was saying, this really gives you a, 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 a fairly fine-grained understanding of what folks on the technical side are, are encountering, what they're dealing with, so that you can work with them and understand actually what's going on, not, not merely have to sort of rely solely on what they're telling you, um, and not have the facility to be able to understand at least generally what these different controls uh, do. Um, Cybersecurity 2 pivots and has a more policy focus uh, and you develop a, a set of technical controls for an institution like Ohio State or Cleveland State um, um, to, add, to comply with these various regulatory requirements that are out there. But again, it's, it's on that technical side, it's not a legal policy. Okay, and then privacy law and management uh, is our is our upper level core course on the legal business side. It's an operationally focused survey of the major privacy laws that are out there. Emphasis on U.S., although it talks about uh, Europe's general data protection regulation. Uh, it's taught by um, Holly's former boss, uh, who recently retired as the chief privacy officer at Nationwide Insurance, and um, who's actually um, soon to be announced by Ohio's governor as. Uh, uh, what what he what he refused to let them call Ohio's cybersecurity czar. Uh, he's going to be ch in charge of um, uh, cybersecurity policy and um, and some of the operations statewide. Um, so it's a fantastic course. I I co-built it with Kirk Harris is his name, and you go through not all the major laws and then learn how to create a program around those laws. To Holly's point, how do you how do you actually implement this? Get people to do what you want to do. And think about what the alternatives are when you can't have a, a hundred percent um, compliant program because most, frankly, most organizations don't get there or certainly can't get there right away. Uh, and then corporate compliance one and two pulls that lens back out and talks about how privacy and cybersecurity fit within compliance generally um, and how you, you know, and give you really the, the basics of becoming a compliance professional uh, and set you up if you're interested to be um, to get certified as a compliance professional, and there's a separate sort of family certifications that sit around general compliance as well as the more specific ones within privacy and cybersecurity. Uh, then HIPAA and privacy covers um, the healthcare law, which we mentioned before. That is the that is the most extensive um, and um, intensive of the major federal laws in the U.S. So by understanding HIPAA, you really are able to understand 
most of the other laws. They all follow a similar framework um, and that map to uh, certain industry standards. Cyber law then moves in a slightly different direction uh, and you, you learn about the, the criminal law and international uh, legal and national security dimensions of cybersecurity. Um, that is taught uh, by a professor at the United States Air Force Academy who was a former member of Cyber Command within the US Air Force. Uh, a really fantastic uh, individual um, that gives a perspective that that um, um, you know that's that's actually critically important because when we're talking about cybersecurity, inevitably we're talking about criminals. <laughs> that is what most of the attacks come from, and and a and a large proportion of those criminals actually are either um, international criminal gangs with with some affiliation with state actors or state actors uh, indirectly themselves. And so understanding that aspect of it is an important dimension for that 360 degree view. Uh, and then the technical capstone uh, is created by the same uh, professional who creates and teaches Cybersecurity One. This uses the Ohio Cyber Range, which is a sophisticated set of facilities that we have access to. We are a regional center of excellence for the range. And um, you, you, you walk through some labs that you would take as a, um, an upper level cybersecurity graduate student um, that, that are tied to the certified ethical hacking um, certification, which is one of the, the major certifications in the cybersecurity realm and builds on the, the technical um, understanding you gain in cybersecurity one uh, and, and gives you a little bit even more in depth experience with this and um, understanding of, of how these attacks work, where they come from. Uh, what the responses are. And that's that's the, the program. Um, I'll let Julie, uh, I'll, I'll kick it back to Julie and let her tell you a little bit more about uh, timing, getting more information and applications. Thank you so much, Brian. And of course, thank you to Holly. Um, I'm so curious about what you what OSU does for the Department of Defense, but I know you can't talk about that, but that really piqued my interest. Um, but anyway, Brian, thank you for going over the curriculum in depth. I do want to mention one thing. Um, as you can see, these 10 courses are all part of the program. They're designed, uh, the program's designed to be completed on a part-time basis. So you take two courses at a time across um, about five semesters it'll take you to complete. We do have some students that take one course, potentially even up to three courses per semester. So Brian and I can be flexible um, and we just ask that you set up a meeting with us, talk to us and we can make um, the best schedule available for you. Um, so like Brian mentioned, I do want to discuss some next steps if you are interested in this program and want to apply. We enroll for this program for every semester, so fall, spring, and summer. Our next cohort begins um, May 9th, which is our technically our summer start date. The application deadline for summer is April 25th, so if you are interested, you still have a little bit of time to apply um, for this upcoming cohort. The application process is very simple. And some of you that are on the call can attest that if you and I speak, we can make it even more simple for you. Um, but as a whole, we, we require that you complete the online application and you can do that via our webpage, onlinelaw.csuohio.edu. Um, we need a current resume, a personal statement, and your official transcripts. However, if you and I have conversations or you and Brian have conversations, we often will waive that personal statement um, because we learn about that through the recruitment process with you. Um, so like I said, the application deadline is April 25th. I really encourage you if you are interested to set up a meeting with me or Brian um, so we can really go over if this program is the right fit for you and help make the application process as seamless as possible. Um, that is all I have on my end. Am I forgetting anything, Brian, or is there anything else you or Holly would like to, to say before we let our participants go for the day? I just want to thank our attendees again and reemphasize what Julie said. We're, you know, we're here. We're, we're a relatively small program. We try to, to really work with each student individually. So please don't hesitate to reach out and, um, you know, we'll, we're happy to work with you to figure out um, if you're interested in this area and have you know, questions about your background and, um, and you know, are looking to try to configure it in a way that, 
that works for you, we're happy to do that. So don't hesitate to reach out and start with Julie, but she'll pass uh, you on to me if, if, you know, if necessary. And I'm always happy to talk to prospective students and students. Well, actually, the last thing I should mention, Julie, if you'll, if, if or I'll try to pop it into the chat. Uh, we, the center is having its annual conference on um, May 19th and 20. And um, anybody who attends our webinars is welcome to attend uh, as a guest of the center. Uh, it's one of the benefits of being a student here is you get to participate in, in all these great events that we put together. And this is our, our highlight of the year. Uh, use all caps student to waive the fee, um, the registration fee. And please let us know if you register so that we can um, and find, find me. And uh, I think Julie's planning to be there for a good chunk of it. So find us, we'd, we'd love to talk to you there, see you there. Um, that was a and, great point, and Brian. And that's just one thing to mention, as a student in this program, you get access to events like that and other events that we have throughout the year. Yeah, and I should mention, uh, Holly is um, one of the co-organizers of a fantastic panel that'll go even more in depth into these issues around operationalizing privacy. So um, with that, if there's no other questions, we're, We'll give you guys 20 minutes back of your life and hope to hear from you. I think we're good. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you again to Brian and Holly, and we really hope to talk to you soon. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Holly. Take care. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.